In this lesson, we're moving past performance into our discussion of remedies. So at this point, we know how to determine whether or not we have a breach of contract. We know if we have formation of a traditional enforceable contract and either party fails to perform their legal duties under the contract and that non-performance is not excused, then that party is liable for breach of contract and the plaintiff is then entitled to remedies. So what we want to focus on now is how do we actually determine what remedies are available and how do we calculate the actual amounts, right? And that's what we're going to focus on in today's video. And the good news here is that 95% of your remedies analysis is right here on the board. It's very straightforward, very simple. Once you know all the formulas and how it plays out, it's usually a very easy place on a contract's fact pattern to just rack up a ton of points. So we really want to focus on monetary damages, expectation damages, and reliance damages because that's again where most of your points on a contract law fact pattern are going to come from. So in contract law, right, your default standard, right, if you find that there's a breach of contract, just your typical breach of contract action, the default remedy that is available is what we call expectation damages, right? We go to monetary damages and say, that we need to calculate expectation damages, right? So in contract law, you can think about this as MIM, right? We have monetary damages, at equitable relief, and mitigation of damages, right? And so our two main categories of relief, though, are monetary damages and equitable relief. Monetary damages, of course, is an actual dollar amount. That's where the plaintiff is being awarded $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 for a breach of contract. We're actually awarding the plaintiff a monetary value. Now, if the court, for whatever reason, finds that a monetary damage is insufficient or inadequate, they might be entitled to some form of equitable relief, which will require some type of specific performance on the defendant's part. But again, nine times out of 10, breach of contract, your default standard is monetary damages. And under monetary damages, the main type of damage, your default for a breach of contract action is expectation damages, right? Now, the plaintiff ultimately is going to get to choose if there's a breach of contract action between expectation damages and reliance damages, but they have to choose one or the other. And we're about to find that expectation damages usually is going to be a higher number than reliance damages. That's why expectation damages has just become the default, right? This is the most amount of monetary damages the plaintiff is typically going to be able to receive or be awarded in a breach of contract action. So let's just jump into it, right? And all of this should be very straightforward. Remember, again, once we determine that there's a breach of contract action, our default is monetary damages. Our default damage for monetary damages is expectation damages. So the good news with expectation damages is the second restatement, section 347, gives us a straightforward, can't miss formula to apply. If you apply this formula that I have here on the board, you cannot miss this, right? This is a bulletproof formula. So anytime you're trying to calculate expectation damages, you just want to plug in these four variables and that's going to give you your number and you're going to rack up all of the points that you can get for expectation damages, right? That's the good thing about remedies. It's not as open to interpretation as some of the other subjects we've been talking about in formation and performance. Remedies is very binary, right? It's just a math problem. And fortunately, it's a very easy math problem. So let's just jump into it, right? What is expectation damages? Expectation damages, the goal here is to put the plaintiff in the position they would have been if the contract had been performed as promised, right? Sometimes I call this the crystal ball damages, right? This is where we look into the crystal ball, right? And we say, what would the plaintiff have received here? What would they have gotten if this contract had been performed as promised? But for the breach, what would the plaintiff have received, right? What was he expecting to get out of this contract. That's expectation damages. So how do we calculate this? 
right? We have the formula here on the board. It's going to be the loss in value plus other losses minus cost avoided minus loss avoided, right? So what we're taking here is the loss in value, really the expectation, other losses and subtracting avoidances, right? Cost and loss avoidance. So what is loss in value? Loss in value is going to be the value that the plaintiff should have received under the contract minus the value the plaintiff did receive under the contract. So if you enter into a contract with a builder, right, and you are going to pay a builder to build you some sort of construction project, a house for $100,000, right, and you don't pay them a single dollar, and then there's a breach of contract, their loss in value is $100,000, right? If you promise to pay them $100,000 and you haven't paid them any of that $100,000, the value they should have received, that builder is $100,000, the value they did receive is zero, so their loss in value would be $100,000. Now, if you paid them a $20,000 down payment, then they've received $20,000 out of the $100,000, their loss in value is $80,000, right? Very straightforward calculating loss in value. Literally, what was the amount promised under the contract? Subtract the amount the plaintiff has already received. Okay, then we have other losses. We tack this on to our damages calculation. Other losses include incidental costs plus consequential costs. So what are incidental costs and consequential costs? An incidental cost is a general damage, right? It's a cost that would be typically associated with any breach of contract action, right? These are things like the cost of storing goods, the cost of finding a new buyer, the cost of getting a replacement, right? These are the types of costs that are typically associated with breach of contract actions. And as long as they're reasonable, right, the plaintiff is incurring these costs reasonably to avoid further loss, right, we're going to reimburse them for these incidental costs. Again, these are costs that are typically associated with breach of contract actions, things like the cost of storing goods, right? Imagine that you enter into a construction contract with someone, right, and the builder for $100,000 and the builder goes out and spends $20,000 on lumber, right? And then you breach. Well, now he's got $20,000, you know, dollars worth of lumber just laying around. He's got to do something with that lumber. He's going to go take it to a warehouse to have it stored, right? That storage cost he's going to get reimbursed for. That's an other loss. That's an incidental cost we would typically associate with breach of contract, right? He has to do something with this lumber. Can't just let it sit on the street. Has to go put it in a warehouse. If it costs a thousand dollars, you know, for him to store it in this warehouse until he can relocate the resources, that's an incidental cost he's going to get reimbursed for. So we add this to the loss and value equation. Now, consequential costs are costs that are unique to this particular or this specific plaintiff, right? These are not costs that we typically associate with breach of contract actions. And the rule is unforeseeable consequential costs or costs, consequential costs that could not have been anticipated by the other party or were not anticipated by the parties when entering into the contract, right, are going to be unrecoverable. If the consequential cost is unforeseeable or not anticipated by the other party at the time of contracting, we say it's not recoverable. But if the consequential cost was foreseeable or anticipated by the other party at the time of contracting, we can tack it on to our calculation, right? That is going to be recoverable, right? So the famous case here, everyone's probably read from the 1800s that established this rule is Hadley v. Baxendale, right? If you remember in that case, we had a sawmill, their crankshaft, whatever that is, breaks, and their whole operation shuts down because they don't have this one part, this crankshaft. So they need a new crankshaft delivered to them. So they reach out and they have this delivery service that's going to deliver them the crankshaft. The delivery service has no idea 
that the entire operation depends on this crankshaft. So of course, they take their time even though the, the mill needs it immediately. So days pass before the mill gets it and the mill wants to recover their lost profits because from this delivery service because they've now been out of business for three, four, five days, whatever it is, you know, waiting on this delivery of this crankshaft. And the court there says, look, that's an unforeseeable consequential cost, right? That's an unforeseeable consequential damage. That delivery service had no way of knowing that your entire business relied on a quick delivery of this crankshaft. So we're not going to allow you to recover for it. That's an unforeseeable consequential cost, right? So again, the test here, if it's unique or specific to this particular plaintiff, like a crankshaft, something that's not typically associated with you know, a breach of contract action, it's consequential to this particular situation, the test is whether it was foreseeable or unforeseeable or whether the party, the other party, could have anticipated this consequential cost, right? If it's foreseeable or it was anticipated, you are allowed to tack it into your comp, you are allowed to recover and tack it on to your calculation. If it's unforeseeable, you can't recover, right? Okay, so that's the first half of the equation where we're, ta where we're tabulating really the amount, the maximum amount that the plaintiff can recover. But then we have to, once we have that number, we have to subtract cost avoided and loss avoided. The cost avoided is going to be the value that the plaintiff saves by not having to perform any further. So again, sticking with our builder, you know, construction project fact pattern, if a builder is estimating that they're going to have to spend $90,000 to complete the project and they've only spent $20,000 of that $90,000 they're estimating that they have to spend, then they're saving $70,000, right? When this breach of contract happens, that's an additional $70,000 that they don't have to spend, that they're saving by not having to perform any further. So there we would say the cost avoided is $70,000. You take the estimated expenses and basically subtract the amount spent. Easy way to calculate cost avoided, right? They were expecting to have to spend $90,000. They've only spent $20,000 of the $90,000, so they avoid a cost of $70,000. We're going to subtract subtract that from the loss in value and other losses. Also, we have this idea of loss avoided, which also has to be subtracted. So if there's any value P recovers by salvaging resources that would have been used to perform the contract, we also deduct that. So if the you know, builder goes out and buys $10,000 worth of lumber, right? And he can't use it in this project because there's a breach of contract, but he's able to immediately relocate it to a project down the street that same day and use the lumber. Well, he's just avoided loss there on that lumber. So we're gonna subtract the $10,000, right? Because he was able to use that lumber. He's able to salvage it and relocate it. So he avoided loss and we're gonna subtract that from the expectation damage recovery. Notably, even if, right, even if that builder failed to take the reasonable steps and mitigate his damages by salvaging that lumber, right, remember we have this duty to mitigate damages. So the court, even if he does not, you know, salvage the goods, because he has a duty to, if it's reasonable, the court's gonna subtract it anyways under this duty to mitigate damages. So you always wanna look out for losses avoided. If it would have been easy, right? If there was reasonable steps that the builder or the plaintiff could have taken to reduce their damages, right? The court is going to automatically reduce any additional losses incurred by the failure to take those reasonable steps. And a lot of times you see it at the end of this equation with loss avoided. So you would calculate it right as it happened, but then you would say the court limits the damages for this failure to do to gate, this failure to mitigate damages, right? So you would calculate it as is, well, okay, there's no loss avoided because he didn't salvage the resources, but the court is going to impose 
this loss and voided for a failure to mitigate damages, right? So just something to keep in mind there. But again, the question is going to be, did the value or did the plaintiff recover any value by salvaging or relocating the resources that would have been used to perform the contract, right? So we can bring this all together with a very straightforward fact pattern. And again, below this video, I'm going to put a bunch of different little or several little hypothetical fact patterns and nuances to the fact pattern. So you can see how all of these variables interplay, because again, the best way to do damages is to just sit there and work through practice problems. Me up here talking about it will only go so far. What you really need to do is sit down on paper with a pen and look at fact patterns and see how it all plays out on paper. I know I've worked with enough students to know that's the better way to do remedies. I'm just trying to give you an overview here, but we can do a really basic, typical breach of contract fact pattern to see what it looks like, but please make sure you check out below this video to see an actual hypothetical and how it all plays out, right? So, you know, but the classic example here and what it usually looks like, you know, with our builder example, we can stick with that in these numbers. So let's say that you enter into a contract with a builder. This contract, you're gonna pay the builder $100,000 to build you a home, right? Let's say that the builder estimates that his expenses for this project are going to be $90,000. So he's expecting a profit of $10,000, right? He's going to get paid under the contract $100,000. He's planning to spend $90,000 of his own money. So he's expecting a profit of $10,000. Well, let's say that he begins to work on the project. He spends $10,000 on labor. He spends $10,000 on materials. And then there's a breach of contract, right? Something happens. The, there's repudiation, so he's now suing in court for breach of contract, right? The other side fails to perform a duty. Now we're in court, he's suing, seeking expectation damages. How do you calculate this? Well, we plug in our four variables, right? What's the loss in value? What's the value the plaintiff, the builder, should have received under the contract minus the value that he did receive? Well, here, he was supposed to get $100,000 and he hasn't received anything, so his loss in value, right, would be $100,000. Let me write that in. 100k. Now, does the plaintiff, does this builder have any other losses? Were there any incidental costs or consequential costs associated with this project? No, in this fact pattern, we didn't lay any out, right? There was nothing like cost of storing goods, no general incidental costs that would have been typical to a breach of contract action. And we didn't have any unique damages to this particular plaintiff. So, you know, or at least foreseeable consequential damages or unforeseeable consequential costs. So really there's no other losses we have to worry about. And a lot of times, by the way, you know, you won't have all four variables. You might on some, if it's a really confusing fact pattern, they're really trying to test remedies. But a lot of times, you know, it'll be very straightforward. You'll just have the loss and value without other losses. You know, normally you have loss and value and costs avoided. A lot of times other losses and loss avoided are both zero, like what we're drawing up here, right? But so again, we have 100K for the loss and value. There's no other losses, so that's going to be zero dollars. Then we have the cost avoided. Right, and sometimes this is where I see some mistakes happen, but again, it's pretty easy, right? So if, the, if we're thinking about the value that P saves by not having to perform any further, what's that number going to be? Well, he estimated that he was going to have to spend a total of $90,000. And thus far on the project, he spent 10,000 on labor and 10,000 on materials for a total of $20,000. So he saves $70,000 by not having to perform any further. When he gets sued for breach of contract, he gets to stop, right? And he's only spent 20,000 out of the 90,000. So his cost avoided here is $70,000. So we can put in 70K, right? And then do we have any loss avoided? Was he able to salvage the lumber or anything like that? Let's say that there was no way to salvage, right? He doesn't have any loss avoided. So we can put this at zero, right? It was a you know, situation where this was a, you know, once in a lifetime build for him. He didn't have any other projects. Maybe it's a newer business. He doesn't have other clients. There's no way for him to salvage any resources, you know, and use it on another project for whatever reason. So 
Here, the calculation for expectation damages is very easy, right? We just take the 100K plus zero, minus 70, minus zero, we get $30,000 in expectation damages, right? And the way to double check this is pretty simple, right? So what was the, you know, because the goal of expectation damages, right, is to put the plaintiff in the position he would have been but for the breach. You know, what was he expecting to get out of this contract? Well, he was expecting to make $10,000, right? That was the profit he expected. He was going to get 100000 and spend ninety. He was expecting to get $10,000. So what we're doing here is really just making him whole. We're giving him back that amount that he spent, the 20K, we're making him whole on that, and we're giving him his $10,000 profit. So he comes back to $30,000, which is what he would have expected to get under the contract if it had been performed as promise, right? Make him whole on the amount that he spent and give him that $10,000 profit he expected to have, right? That's how expectation damages works. This is a very classic fact pattern, right? So his expectation damages comes out to $30,000. Okay, but let's say for some reason he can't prove expectation damages. It's too speculative. Like we said, maybe it's a new business venture and we're not really sure what his estimated expenses would have been. Maybe it would have been more, maybe it would have been less, right? So what do we have there? If it's very speculative, the court isn't going to allow a plaintiff to recover expectation damages. So in that case, if it's too speculative, right, to look into the crystal ball and see into the future and try and guess what the estimated profit was going to be, if that's too speculative, the court will say, let's look at reliance damages, right? What would your reliance damages be? All right, just write this up. So the goal of reliance damages is to put the plaintiff in the position they would have been if the contract had never been formed. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudicata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. 
I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Sudicata video lectures throughout my law school career, and I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.